Okay, so now we're going to look at the actual real Go programming language, having learned Go Pigeon. And the first thing to understand about Go is that it's a real programming language, and in a real programming language, you're going to be creating much larger programs where you don't want all of your code to just sit in one single source file. That would be inconvenient and awkward in many ways. You want to be able to spread your code across many files, and those files will be organized into directories in larger projects. And so these directories in Go we call packages, and the rule is that to access the code from one package in another, it's not available automatically, you have to import it. So in this program, this is just an extremely simple program, shortest possible program, we're just spinning on Hello World to console, um, but we still have to specify that this source file, this single source file we have is part of a package called main because your, your base level package, the root package of your program is always called main. So that's what this says here. But even for this very simple program, we need to spit text out to console and in Go and in other real languages. They don't have print and prompt operators. They don't have operators built in the language. Instead, there's a part of the so-called standard library, uh, some, some existing code that we have to bring into our, our, our programs that will do printing and prompting and other kind of input and output for us. And in Go, the part of the standard library that does that for us is called the fumpt package, fumpt short for format. And so we need to bring in the fumpt package by importing it at the top of our file. As a rule, your source file has to start with a package statement declaring what package the source file is in. And if you have imports, they have to go after the package statement before everything else. In this case, we're just importing one package, the fumpt package. And now having imported the fumpt package, we can call the functions of the fumpt package. As we're doing here, we're calling the function print line from fumpt. So we're specifying from fumpt dot and then what we want to call from that package and it's called print line with a capital P. Uh, unlike in GoPigeon, um, capital names don't imply that it's a type name. You can have variables and functions starting with capital letters and type names don't necessarily start with capital letters. They can, but they don't necessarily. So it's a, there's a different significance of capitalization in, in Go, which we'll talk about shortly. Anyway, so this is our main function and functions are written in Go with func, just like in GoPigeon. Uh, then the name of the function and then you put parameters of the function inside parens. And even if your function doesn't have any parameters, then you still need the parens. And then the body of the function, Go does not use indentation to denote bodies. Instead, it uses curly braces to surround the bodies of your, of your functions and the, and the bodies of your ifs and loops and all those things. Um, and so you put a curly brace here, and then you have some number of statements, in this case, just one, and then you end the body of the function with a curly brace. And the language really doesn't care how I indent this body. I could do that and it's still valid. It, it, the language just really does not care. But despite that, uh, for good style, you should format your code. You should indent it exactly like we did in GoPigeon. So in practice, that's how you're gonna indent your code anyway. But understand the language itself does not care. The language is looking for these curly braces to, to know when your, your bodies begin and end. It doesn't really care about the indentation. So also notice that function calls, they're not in prefix notation. Instead, you put the name of the function first. Here it's fump.println. That's specifying the function print line from the fump package. You then put parens after the name of the function and any arguments to the function go inside the parens and you separate them by commas. So if we had multiple arguments here, we'd put a comma here and some, some other argument and then more arguments, etc. But in this case, we just have the one argument, the string. So this is a complete Go program and we can now execute it. And the way we'll do that from the command line is, so the way you can run a Go program is by typing Go. There are a few different subcommands. If we just type Go help, it'll list all the subcommands and we'll explain uh, the most important of these uh, down the line. Uh, the most important is generally, we'll build, compiles your, your packages, compiles your code, but it doesn't run it. Um, and then run will compile and run and So just in, in one, one command, if you want to compile and run your program, you should just do go run. So let's do that, go run. And then you specify with run, you specify all the files that make up your program. Uh, go run, you don't, it's, it's just used for quick and dirty examples. It's not something you use all that much in more serious development. It's, it's useful for quick demos and, and educational examples, but otherwise it's not used all that much. But I'm going to use it here. So go run, and the name of this file is go lesson.go. It compiled it and it ran it and it spelled console hello there just like we wanted to right here. So we ran our first Go program, real Go program. 
Okay, let's do something slightly more interesting. I'm going to copy this over. Uh, here is a program which, again, is just a single source file. So we have to say it's part of package main. It's importing from because we want to spit text out to console down here. And let's look at our main function first. So uh, the, the Go Pigeon code would look like this. We're creating two locals, one called numbers, which is a slice of ints, and results, which is an integer. In Go, the way you declare a variable is with a var statement. You write var, the name of the variable, and then the type, and this is how you specify a slice of ints. You have an empty pair of square brackets, then the, the type of slice it is. And notice again, our type names are not necessarily capitalized. And we can have, instead of just one local statement, we can have multiple var statements. So this is declaring also a variable result of type int. And then for an assignment in Go, and actually almost all mainstream languages, you write the target on the left of an equal sign, and then the value to assign on the right. It looks like an equation in mathematics, but that's highly misleading because it's not really an equation. We're not saying that these two things are, are always equal to each other. We're just saying take this value on the right and store it in the thing on the left. That's what it really means. So it's an assignment. And the way you write a slice, you create a slice in actual Go syntax, is you specify the type of slice, then you have curly braces, and you list the values separated by commas uh, inside the curly braces. So this is a slice with five int values. If we wanted an empty slice, it would look like that, but we want five values. And then we're going to call the sum function, which we declared up above. We'll look at that in a second, but we're passing in this slice of numbers and the result we are storing, we're assigning to this variable called result. And then we're gonna print out the value of result. We of course don't actually need the variable result. We could just directly plug the value in there, but uh, let's keep it. And lastly, we actually don't have to put our variable declarations at the top of our function. We can put them anywhere in the function as long as the variable declared isn't used before its declaration. So we can put this declaration of result down here before result is used, but we couldn't put it down here. That would then be a compilation error. So we could do this. And in fact, we can combine a declaration of a variable and its initial assignment into one statement. So I'm just going to do this. This is declaring a variable called numbers, which is a slice of ints, and then assigning it its initial value. And we could do the same thing here. We could just combine this into one statement. So this is still valid. And as a further convenience, Go has what's called inferred typing, where when we declare a variable and we initialize it, the compiler, because it knows the type of the value being assigned to the variable, we don't have to explicitly say what the type is. We can just leave this implied. We can leave it implicit and the compiler will know, oh, because this is a slice of ints, it knows that this variable we're creating should be a slice of ints. So it's implicitly as if we wrote slice of ints there. And same thing here, because sum is a function that the compiler knows returns an int, it knows that the type of result is supposed to be an int. And as a further convenience, instead of writing var in this form, we can just write colon equals, and so that's more compact. So this is in fact how Go programmers will almost always write their variable declarations. The only time you need var is when you're creating a variable and you just want it to default to the, the so-called default value, what Go calls the zero value. So if we wanted a variable result of type int and we just wanted to default to its zero value, we don't want to specify what the value is, then we can just have a var statement like this. Otherwise, we almost always use the colon equals syntax. So in fact, in this case, the way almost any Go programmer would write it is like this, colon equals. So numbers and results are being declared here implicitly from the colon equals. Okay. And so looking at the sum function here, in GoPigeon code, we're declaring a local variable total of type integer, uh, assigning initial value zero, which we don't actually need to do because it defaults to zero, but I just made that explicit. And then we have a for each loop where we have i and v, both integers. We're looping over the values of nums, which is a, a parameter, which is a slice of integers. And we are each time through assigning to total the addition of total and v. So we're accumulating all the values into total. And once we're done with the loop, we're going to return the value of total. The Go code equivalent is declaring a function sum, single parameter called nums, which is a slice of ints. And this function returns an int. And we're declaring our variable total to be an int. 
and have the initial value zero. We, we don't need this line. We could just, this is actually probably how most programmers would write it because this creates a variable total of type int and it'll default to zero because that's a default int value. Uh, actually, probably most people would write this and this would be the same thing. If you have an integer number as the value of a, of a colon equals assignment, the compiler assumes that the variable is supposed to be an int. So that's probably how most people would write this. And then a for each loop is not written for each. You write the word for, and then you have uh, the two variables, which I call i and v here. You separate by commas. You don't specify the type. Instead, we use colon equals, and so their type is an inferred. It's left inferred, it's left implicit. You write the reserved word range, and then you put the slice array or map or whatever the thing it is we're iterating through, you put that here. And notice here, instead of I, I wrote underscore. This is the so-called blank identifier, which is a special variable name, which means I don't actually want to use this thing because the Go compiler is actually very picky about unused variables. If I wrote I here, we're not using I anywhere in the code and the compiler will complain that I is unused. So to get around that, because we have to put something here, there has to be something that um, the for range syntax is expecting us to create two variables, one for the index. And so to get around this problem, I could use the so-called blank identifier to say, I don't actually care about this value, so I'm not gonna use this variable. And then looking inside the loop, which again is surrounded in curly braces, because that's how we denote the bodies of things in, in Go, you put curly braces around them. It's just a single statement. And, and again, the compiler doesn't care how we indent the lines inside this, this body. We can do whatever kind of indentation we want, though we should just stick to the uh, normal style. And our single statement here is assigning to total the result of adding total and v. Again, we don't have prefix notation in, in Go or in most any mainstream language. Instead, we have infix notation where most of the operators are binary operators. They take two operands and they go in between their two operands. And so this is adding total and v together. And we don't necessarily put them in parens. We could put parens. The thing about infix notation is you can actually just put any number of parens around your expressions and it's still equivalent. And sometimes that's useful for style, but in this case, there would be no reason to do so. The only reason we really need uh, parentheses in our expressions is well one when we're calling a function, of course. So like some numbers here to call some, you suffix the, the function name with parens and put the arguments inside. We use parens surrounding our parameters of our functions, but that's totally unrelated, just a totally different meaning there of the parens. And then the other time we use parens is when you have a, a mix of operations, like say we multiply this by three. Well, with infix operators, we have an order of precedence amongst our operators. The multiplication operator has a higher precedence than the addition operator, and so this would be multiplying v times three and then adding the result of that to total. And so implicitly, it's as if there are parens around this multiplication because it's done first. Um, and in fact, we could write these parens explicitly. This is, this is valid, though whether we do so is just a matter of style in this case. But when we need parens is what if we want the addition here to be done first? It has lower precedence than the multiplication. So to make it be done first, we would have to put that in parens. And now it's clear that, okay, this is added together. Then the result of that is multiplied by three. So we use parens with our binary operators to uh, subvert the normal order of precedence. It's how we control our order of precedence in certain cases. And the last thing here is that there's a, actually a shorthand for this particular kind of statement where we're assigning it to total, we're assigning it to a variable, the result of that variable added to another thing, and so we can just write total plus equals v, and that's just shorthand for this. If we were multiplying things together, like if it was total uh, times v, same deal, you could write uh, times equals as a shorthand. These are the compound assignment operators and they're just little shorthand conveniences for some common cases. And in fact, there's a special shorthand for incrementing and decrementing variables. So instead of having to write total equals total plus one, well, you could write total plus equals one and that would be shorthand, but there's an even more convenient uh, shorthand total plus plus, and that's the same thing. So these are all incrementing the value of total by one. And if you want to decrement a value by one, same deal. You, instead of writing total minus one, you can write minus equals one or minus minus to decrement total by one. So that's all just shorthand conveniences. Okay, so that's our complete program and let's see this in action. Let's run the program. Go run in the name of our source file, golazon.go, hit enter. And it prints out negative 39 because that's what is stored in result. The results returned from sum. 
And that's apparently what we get when you add together 6, 2, 1, 8, and negative 56. So yeah, 8 plus 9, 17. Yeah, 17 plus negative 56 is negative 39. Okay.